The climate crisis affects us all, and we all have the power to help solve it. I'm standing here on my family's farm in Carthage, Tennessee, where I first learned as a young kid from my parents' connection to this land, and that's what originally sparked my passion for the natural world. These days, when I'm presenting my slideshow in communities all around the world, I do my best to talk with every audience about the incredible onrushing impacts of the climate crisis in each local community where I'm presenting, and just as importantly, about the solutions to the crisis that are now readily available everywhere. I also try to convey my story and why I personally feel so moved to help protect our climate balance. We've now trained more than 12,000 climate leaders to carry this message around the world. And now it's your chance to join the movement. Please be a part of this sustainability revolution that's sweeping the world. This is the first picture of the Earth fully illuminated that any of us ever saw on the last of the Apollo missions, and it changed the way humanity thought about our common home. And in the decades uh, since, we have been trying to solve the climate crisis. By now, there are only three questions remaining. Must we change? Can we change? And will we change? So let's take them one by one. First of all, must we change? The science uh, community all around the world has been telling us for a long time we have to, yes, and now Mother Nature is telling us, but let's take a look at why. The sky is not a vast and limitless expanse the way it appears viscerally. It's a very thin shell of atmosphere surrounding the planet. And we're putting into that thin space 110 million tons of man-made global warming pollution every 24 hours. The way it works, uh, most people know, is that the energy from the sun comes in the form of light and it warms up the planet and then that heat energy is re-radiated back into space and some of it is caught by the natural greenhouse gas layer and that's a good thing. But we're making that layer much thicker so more of the outgoing infrared is being trapped and that's what is driving the temperatures up. And there are many causes of uh, man-made global warming pollution. Agriculture is a part of it and the management of forests and transportation. Uh, but the main part of it uh, is the burning of fossil fuels, which provides more than 80% of all the energy the world uses. And it's been going up particularly since World War II and in recent decades. As a result, all this heat's being trapped and the air temperature's going up quite dramatically. Uh, and this is uh, causing record-breaking years. 16 of the 17 hottest years ever measured with instruments have been since 2001, and the hottest of all was last year. And of course, heat uh, itself is a problem in many parts uh, of the world, many parts uh, of this country. But on a global basis, more than 90% of all this extra heat energy is going into the oceans, and they're heating up pretty rapidly. And this makes the ocean-based storms like hurricanes and typhoons and cyclones stronger and more destructive. And it also disrupts the water cycle because the water vapor coming off the oceans is increasing very significantly as the oceans warm. And th that's carried over the land and falls in much bigger precipitation events, both rain and snow. So we get these record downpours and that leads to record flooding. And it's been happening all over the world. Every night on the TV news is like a nature hike through the book of Revelation now. And the same extra heat that's disrupting the water cycle and making the downpours bigger is sucking the moisture out of the soil and making the droughts deeper and longer and more destructive. And when the land dries out, the vegetation dries out, and that means when the temperature goes up, fires increase. Now we have these mega fires. This was a city of 100,000 people in Canada destroyed by fire last year and evacuated. The climate-related extreme weather events worldwide, according to the insurance industry, have been steadily going up. Now, 
Same heat is also melting the ice in Antarctica and here in Greenland. This is a huge glacier in the last century and completely melted now. And NASA has uh, precisely measured the decline in the mass of ice on Greenland and Antarctica. And all that extra melting is raising sea level. This was in Miami, Florida, a little over a, a year ago. Sunny day, no rain involved. But it's a high tide. Miami's the number one city at risk in terms of assets uh, at risk, along with Guangzhou, China, New York, and Newark, and these others. If you look at cities at risk by uh, population, a lot of giant cities in developing countries uh, are very much at risk. In fact, the Department of Defense in the US has long warned about refugee crises connected to the climate crisis and pandemic diseases and water shortages and food shortages. Where food is concerned, the extra heat stress is now beginning to decrease crop yields from rice and corn and uh, soybeans. And uh, this is beginning to be a serious uh, problem. It's also a medical emergency because the relationship between humanity and the bacteria and viruses has always been affected by climate. And with temperatures going up and the climate being disrupted, we're seeing tropical diseases spreading poleward. Of course, the transportation revolution and air travel has a lot to do with this, but the places where diseases like Zika take root uh, that changes with the climate. We never had problems with Zika. I never heard of Zika when I was growing up. It's a serious threat, and the main mosquito that spreads it is now uh, covering a wider range in a warmer, wetter world. And the, the virus incubates faster, and in the warmer temperatures, it bites more. So uh, the doctors are very concerned about this. And of course, the biologists are also concerned about the extinction threat. Up to half of all the land-based species with which we share this planet are in danger of extinction, according to the biologists, in this century, unless we make changes. So all of these threats, including some like uh, ocean acidification that we haven't even covered here, help to answer the question, uh, should we change? And for those worried about the economy, most of all, it's the number one threat to the global economy, according to the World Economic Forum. So do we have to change? Yes, we do. But what about the second question? Can we change? If we have to change and we can't, that's a formula for anxiety and depression. But fortunately, <laughs> the answer to this question is very, very exciting and positive. We've got the solutions available to us now. Look, for example, at renewable energy. Wind energy was predicted to give us 30 gigawatts by uh, 2010. Actually, we've exceeded that prediction by 16 times over. There's an exponential curve with wind power being used all over the world now. It's really quite dramatic, and it could supply 40 times as much uh, electricity as the entire world uses. And where solar energy is concerned, it's an even more dramatic story. The predictions 15 years ago were we'd have one gigawatt per year. When 2010 arrived, we exceeded that goal 17 times over. And last year, we exceeded 75 times over. This is really taking off like a skyrocket, an exponential curve, like computer chips and mobile phones and flat screen TVs. It's very exciting because the cost is coming down so rapidly. In some regions, it's now less than half the cost of electricity from burning coal. In many countries where there's no electricity grid, we're seeing solar panels on the roofs of grass huts. And in a, a developing country with great policy, Chile, they have seen a slow, steady growth, but this is working. Look at what's under construction and approved for construction in Chile now. This is incredibly exciting. And there are many regions in the world that are poised for this kind of breakout. 13 and a half gigawatts. This is incredible. So every hour, the, the Earth gets as much energy from the sun to supply all of the energy the entire global economy uses for an entire year. That's really dramatic. So if we increase the fraction of that that we can harvest and use, 
we're really going to make a lot of progress. Batteries are beginning to spread quickly throughout the marketplace. LEDs are predicted in eight years to virtually take over the market, 95% of all light bulbs. All these automobile manufacturers are now offering or preparing to offer electric vehicles. This is another part of the sustainability revolution. So can we change? Yes. But what about that final question? Will we change? Well, here too, there's exciting news. A year ago, December, uh, at the Paris negotiations, virtually every nation in the entire world agreed to phase down greenhouse gas pollution to net zero emissions as early in the second half of this century as possible. And we're seeing marches and demonstrations and demands at the ballot box for the kinds of changes that are needed. So please use your voice and your vote and your choices in the marketplace and in your life to speak truth to power like your world depends on it because your world depends on it. We need your help. Thank you. Thank you.